Constitution, the Declaration of Independence declares that uh, government is there to provide life and liberty as freedom. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Westminster Confession and First the Catechism, uh, the Shorter Catechism, the first question is what is the chief end of man? It's to know God and to enjoy Him forever. To know God and to enjoy Him forever. God's purpose for us is to rejoice, to be happy, to provide uh, for that. I was reading just a quick summary of, of uh, a devotional this morning by David Bread. I get a feed from them and, and my Facebook, and it, it, it dealt, this, dealt with the idea that God wants to be happy. Yes, he does. But that, that happiness is only derived ultimately from him. Everything else in life that you try to find happiness from uh, fails. It's temporary. It doesn't satisfy the longing of, of the heart. And so uh, the, the, the Christian life is, is unique from that, that perspective that, that uh, the Bible and the teaching of the Bible is absolutely essential. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. It was by the word of God, and we have not, our noble said, that we as sinners came to a knowledge of the Word. There was a time in our nation that we understood the importance of the Word of God, and yet our government, our society, all of our, our institutions out there want nothing to do with the Word of God. And I said, I'm sorry. I, the, the older I get, the more important I, I see the, this book for understanding, especially now. And so I invite you to take your Bibles and open to Ephesians 5 again. Last week, we, uh, we looked at the role of the wife in uh, the marriage relationship. And again, I cannot emphasize strongly enough what Steve was emphasizing there, the nuclear family. We use the term nuclear. We're not talking about an atomic bomb. <laughs> We're talking about the traditional family, the traditional family. And Paul, in the pagan world in which he ministered, saw all kinds of variations and perversions of the family. Abortion was prevalent in the ancient world. It was not a new phenomenon. It, it was a sacrament of pagan religions to offer their children in sacrifice to their deities. And Christianity strengthened the institutions that God established even before the fall. And one of those is the institution of the family. We read the text of scripture even beyond it that we all look at this morning. And we want to transition from the role of the wife into the role of the husband in marriage. We pointed out last week that the submission of a wife is, is not like a, a boot camp where the husband is the drill instructor and the wife is the trainee and she comes in and, and salutes what are your orders uh, today. No, that's not the way God designed the family was never intended to be that way, but God did create man as being the head of the woman. Christ is the head of man, and God is the head of Christ. And so there is an order, and uh, that order is being perverted today, especially when all, with all the variations that are being offered. The, the, the latest one that's being pushed is polyamory. That is, uh, men and women having multiple partners. 
uh, in violation of the word. Well, you say, didn't they practice polygamy in the Old Testament? Yeah, they did. They did <coughs> practice polygamy, even part of the people of God. But it was always a distortion of God's original design. And the New Testament, the New Covenant, brings it back into focus again, especially with respect to those who are leaders in the church. And beyond that, something that every family or every uh, believer should aspire to, and that is to, to restore God's original order in the home. And that is that the elder the bishop be a husband of one wife. One wife. This is in the broader context, as we pointed out. It's not just submission, but it's a spirit-filled life. The spirit expresses his presence in the assembly through the corporate worship of the believers in verse 19 speaking to one another which we have done this morning in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the lord that participle relates to the command to be filled with the spirit so you're controlled by the spirit as you worship in this fashion giving thanks that's another participle that explains the command to be spirit controlled is to be a thankful person, to express that thanks in corporate worship through song, through prayer, and so on and so forth. And then the last participle, uh, which the apostle unfolds on in uh, verses 22 and following, is submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in reverence for God. If you respect God, you respect your fellow saints. Uh, you'll treat them in honor, Paul wrote to the Philippians, in honor preferring others better than yourself. That's the humility that is to be expressed among God's people. And it starts off with the wife. You are to submit. It is a command. It doesn't mean that the, the husband doesn't consult with the wife. Remember last week we dealt with the illustration of Nabal and Abigail in the Old Testament. It, he was very disdainful of, of uh, David. Nabal was. And uh, so he dissed him. He disrespected him. And he asked to, for supplies to help his people, and he said, well, who does he think he is? And then, so David got upset. He was ready to come and take out Nabal and his, and his household. Uh, Abigail gets wind of it. She's very understanding and wise and visual. She say his tush. Now, he died subsequently, I think, when he found out what his wife did. But she was the wise one in the house. She was probably what kept that house together, kept it running well. I say that to say sometimes, and, and always, really, always each partner in a marriage has their strengths. And they ought to be recognized. And the husband in love ought to use his wife's strengths and he ought to consult her in all major matters that respect the house, the raising of children, you're to be on the same page together to be able to talk. It's not that all wisdom resides in the husband and that the husband gives the orders regardless, which Nabal did, he gave the orders. I'm not giving him anything, but what does Abigail do? She gathers together quite a feast and takes it to herself, humbles, submits herself in reverence and respect for David, recognizing that ultimately he's going to replace Saul as king of, of Israel. And David recognized her wisdom. 
and interestingly, when Mabel died, either of a stroke or a heart attack, David took her as one of his wives. Because he recognized the prudence, the discernment of this woman. So it's, it's just not a cut and dry matter where, you know, the wife comes up to the husband and says, I'm reporting for duty today. No, that's not it. But they work together. But the ultimate decision of some things rests with the husband as they have. And you move forward on that. And you live with the consequences of that. So, submit. And he gives a comparison here, a simile, as to the Lord. It assumes you're, it's a believing marriage as you submit your lives in reverence to the Lord in the fear of God. You're to submit to the one whom God has placed over you. Well, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. He draws an analogy here between the church and the relationship that a wife has to her husband. The church is under the authority of Christ, and that authority has been given to him because of resurrection. Look back at chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. So, the husband is head, Christ is head, he's the savior or deliverer of the body. And we'll get into more of that as we get into the responsibilities of husband. But he is the Savior. He is the deliverer. And husbands, you are your wife's Savior. You deliver her. She's the weaker vessel. You're to come to her aid and be her strength, physical and spiritual, in your lives. Therefore, is, this is his conclusion, just as the church is subject to Christ, and it is. The church, he's talking the church at large, but he's talking about local expressions of the church, which our church is. We desire first and foremost as a church to submit to Christ. He's the head of this body. We serve, the elders here serve, as under shepherds. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5. We are under the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Just as the church submits or is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in ever I put it this way, in every matter. In, in all matters that pertain to their, their relationship. Not to act in defiance or act outside of your relationship with your husband. Now then we move into the role of, of the husband. The role of the husband. Let's look at that momentarily. Verses 25 through 33. The love of the husband. Actually, men, you have a greater responsibility. As head of your home, you have the responsibility to express what I call sacrificial love. That's what this love is. Sacrificial love. And you are to be interested at, in the welfare of your wife and minister to her sacrificially in terms of finances and time, spiritually. Uh, my wife periodically calls on me like she did this morning. Since I got some questions here about this book of Numbers, and she read the text of Scripture, and I 
didn't have any answers for it, but she she submits to uh, what I've got to think through that my myself. But it opens here in verse 25, the first part of the verse, is, it's the mandate or the command of love, the mandate of love. Husbands, love your own wives. Now he's obviously speaking to every husband in the assembly. And as a husband, obviously that's a job description or a role. And it assumes that you have a wife and you are to love her. It's command, it's present tense, it's ongoing. Often, people entering into marriage, and this is what I tell Nui, Nui was, this is what I tell my grandchildren, whom I've been involved and have married one earlier this year in Texas, Houston area. Here's a joy. One thing young couples don't understand. They don't understand. During the dating period or the courtship period, as some practice it, you, you, you're not really in love. Uh, let that absorb into your minds for a moment. You're not really in love because you haven't had an opportunity fully to express the demands of love, men. Your relationship is infatuation. You're infatuated with each other. You like each other. But it won't be until you come into the nitty gritty of marriage that you begin to express love and the demands of love that are placed upon you as a couple and as a man in particular. And the longer I am married, and next Sunday, it'll be 51 years. 51 years of marriage. The longer I'm married, the more I can, it's hard to fat, I found them, but the more I love the woman, the more I love my wife. Man, you can testify to that. What you know in your love for your wife now is obviously much different that you had when you first began your marriage. And it's, it's that way over in the Orient where parents arrange marriages. One of my friends back in seminary, Joy Cuddy George, I think I've referred to it on occasion, Joy Cuddy went back with his friend from seminary. They were on an evangelistic preaching tour of India, as I remember it. And uh, he obviously had contact with his parents, and his parents told him, you know, there's this young lady who, whom we have conversed with the parents, and, and uh, they're interested in a Christian marriage, and interested in arranging a marriage of their daughter, and uh, they've come and contacted you, and we've explained who you are, and your availability, and so forth like that, and so, Joy Cuddy had to make a decision. He met with this lady, and they talked for three or four hours. And he had to make a decision whether he would go forward at this point after discussing things of, of Christian values and virtues and theology and so forth like that, whether to go forward in consent. Well, he did. He decided to marry this young lady and had not met her before that time. Uh, that's hard for us to fathom. He could have declined. She ultimately could have declined the offer. But they got married and they had children. And he is still ministering, as far as I know, over in India. But they, they, they compare it, they say, you Westerners. <coughs> When you enter into marriage, it's, it's like a pot that's already on a burner because of the courtship and the dating period. You've, you've elevated your levels of, of, uh, of uh, passion 
and so forth like that. And now you enter into marriage and then there is this letdown. Uh, the, the balloon has popped. You begin to get to know that individual, uh, the spouse or the husband. You get, begin to get to know the individual and, and it, so everything cools off. He said, that's the way Western marriages work as a rule. They start off hot and they begin to decline in temperature and then they may even get cold and then they may even become disinterested in each other and seek love elsewhere. But he said over here in the Orient, we start out with a cold pot and we put it on a hot fire and it begins to warm up and develop and the interest in love begins at that point. There's been a movement in our country during my lifetime to move out of that dating mold into more of a courtship relationship. And that is letting the young people get to know each other in a supervised setting, but never letting them, as it were, to be off alone where things can move in bad directions. The point is, that love begins once the exchange of vows have taken place and then there's that entering into the one body relationship. But it's an ongoing thing, it doesn't stop. It isn't here today and gone tomorrow type of thing. It is to be exercised. This is a healthy marriage. This is a spirit controlled marriage. So it's, it's a mandate, it's, it's ongoing. And then he gives the example of love. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Love your husbands, here's the pattern from which you are to draw in terms of this love. The pattern is Christ's love. And the classic verse that correlates, or verses that correlate with this, are from John chapter 3, where it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he's talking about there about the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And he was lifted up. And by that lifting up, he draws men to himself. He was lifted up. And John, it is believed, not Jesus speaking, John 3, 16, explained, well, actually, he's lifted up in order that all who believe should have eternal life and not perish. He gives both sides of the coin. Eternal life, that's the positive, the negative is condemnation has been removed, you'll not perish. That's the type of love that was displayed in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's the very language of Christ that is used here. He gave Himself for her. It was sacrificial. It was voluntary. He was not obligated to do it, but He did do it. For God is so loved. It tells us the nature of God's love in that it is infinite. The bounds of God's love to love sinners is demonstrated in the self-sacrificial love of the Father and the self-sacrificial love of the Son for the church, for His people, for whom He died. Husbands, that's a high and holy pattern to live by, right? You think about it. So I can't love like that. You can't love perfectly. No one can do that. 
But that's the pattern. I don't know why I didn't get that through my skull early on in in our marriage, but in in recent years, it's made more of an impression upon me. And as long as God gives me breath, I will live sacrificially for my wife. She asked me to do something. I'll do it. She wants me to listen to her. I'll listen to her. If it's within my capacity to do it, I'll do it. Even if it demands sacrifice of time and effort, I'll do it. Regard your wife. Regard her interests. Listen to what she has to say. Focus of love. This is substitution. This is the substitutionary atonement of lot of Christ for his church, for his people. He, he's the Savior, verse 23, of the body. And this expands on that role as the head of the church. He's its Savior. chapter 5 verse 2 of this epistle. He says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So the basis for us living our lives in love generally broadly as Christians is the love of Christ again his sacrificial love. You're to love me. I'm to love you. I'm to walk in the sphere of love. It's important. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. But there's an ultimate purpose here. And that's found in verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So God's vehicle, God's instrument that he uses to set or sanctify his people, to set them apart, is through the administration of the word of God, which here is pictured in the figure of a washing it, cleansing. The, the role of the Word of God is to take that which is, is filthy on some level, to some degree, and to clean it, to clean it, to wash it. His church that he is building, his church as it develops, comes out of sin, and sometimes it brings baggage along with it. It comes in, you came in as a believer, as a baby. And just as a baby comes into this world and it messes its drawers, it wets its drawers, it's sloppy when it eats, it has to be groomed, it has to be bathed and cleaned and regularly attended to. So those who come into the church, that's the way it is. And, the, and the, one of the primary means that God uses is the Word of God to clean up His people, to clean His church. Now, the ancient church is different than today. And I was thinking about this just the other day. Because I'm, I'm, I'm doing a study of Psalm 1, and it says of the blessed man that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. The man who's truly happy realizes that the source of his happiness comes from the law of the Lord, the Torah, or more broadly, the Word of God. And back in David's day, if he's the author of that psalm, 
that word was not available to everybody. It was hand copied. It took a lot of time to copy, to make copies of the word. Happened until we got the printing press, the movable type, Gutenberg. And then they began to proliferate, which makes the Word of God available just about for everyone. There are many tribes and nations that still do not have the Word of God. But God uses that. That's, what, that's why one of the first things that missionaries do in virgin soil, virgin missionary soil, soil that's never been touched by outside humans, is they begin to learn the language, and upon learning the language and working with natives, they begin to translate that into the language of the readers. Teach them how to read. They don't even know how to read their own language. Teach them to read. Teach them to write. And it's amazing how the Word of God begins to work in these people's lives as it begins to sanctify them and deliver them from their paganism. That's the power of the Word, the washing of the water by the Word. That's why a church is, well, the pulpit. The pulpit is, is to be the central focus, not because of the preacher, but because the Word of God is expounded here. It's explained here. I realize, you need to realize that it's important that the Bible be explained and applied from this pulpit. And further beyond that, because you have the availability of the Word of God in your mother tongue and in your shelves and on your coffee tables, you have immediate access to it. And you ought to be there to be cleansed by it. Because Christ uses it to set apart his people. What was he praying in that high priestly prayer? Sanctify them. First of all, he said, thy word is true. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Set your people apart. Wash them. <clears throat> And then he has an ultimate goal with his church. Another purpose, verse 27, that he might present her, the church, to himself, a glorious church. So through this process of sanctification, through the word, the Holy Spirit of God working through the word, and sanctifying it to their hearts, ultimately he presents a faultless church before the Father. It's going to be a day at the wedding supper of the Lamb where the bride is presented to the groom and they enter into that fullness of that glorious union which they know at the present. That he might present her, offer to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing any blemishes in that church. And how the church today, I say professing church today, needs that work of sanctification. I, I pray to the Lord Jesus. I pray to Him, purify your church. Start here. Right in Rio Rico. Purify your church. Make it clean. Use the Word. Use the Spirit to make your people clean. No spot, no wrinkle, any such thing. No blemishes in this church, but that she should be holy. And without blemish. And so he makes the application. So husbands ought to love their own wives. 
this is the second area that he deals with, a second area of the focus of love. You're to love Christ as Christ loved the church, and then you're to love your wife as you care for your own body. So ought men, and that word ought, I, you know, as I was reading it, we kind of just glean over it. We just kind of read past it. So ought men, ought, ought, obligation, debt, duty. Men ought to love. Do you love your wives? Do you see that you have an obligation to love your wives? To demonstrate it tangibly in their lives? That word is used in Luke chapter 17, interestingly. Luke chapter 17. Verses 5 through 10. Jesus here shows the, the role of a servant and what, what he is supposed to do. Verse 7, I want to focus there. Which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat? Rhetorical question. The answer to the question is you don't. He's not through. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded to him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was, and here's the word, it's translated here, our duty or our obligation. Men, you have an obligation, a duty to your wife. You think she's your servant? You are a person. You submit one to another. That's the role of the one who is over someone to serve others. Just as a master is to serve or submit to his slaves. A Christian master, verse 9 of chapter 6. And you masters do the same to them, giving of threatening, knowing that your own master is him. The master has an obligation to his servants, similar to Philemon and Onesimus. Love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. How can that be true? How can he who loves his wife love himself? It's based on the principle which you'll we'll see ultimately the union of a man with his wife. They become one flesh. Verse 31. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. She is your flesh. She is bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. And you are obligated to love her as you do your own self. Because you are united to her as Christ is united to the church. And again, he appeals to the church to make his point. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. 
We are united with Christ vitally. We're members of his body. We draw from our head the Lord Jesus. Everything emanates from the head, and so it is in your own body. Everything emanates from this computer center <clears throat> up in your skull, the head of the body. So you're to love her like you love yourself. In a question and answer period after one of his lectures, uh, C.S. Lewis was asked which of the world's religions gives his followers the greatest happiness. Lewis paused and said, this is what he uh, quoted, while it lasts, the religion of worshiping oneself is best. I know there's a context to that statement and I wish was, but it makes the point. Uh, the primary religion that is exercised today in our selfish world is my interests, because we are selfish people. We're egotistical, and some more than others. In a marriage relationship, egos have to be set aside in order for it to succeed and be blessed. Men must care for their wives just the way they care for their own bodies. When you get up in the morning, do you put clothes on? Do you check in the mirror to see where your beard is? Shave it off? Do you do other things to the day to print yourself? Do you eat at the table because it's important to you? You care for yourself. And just as Christ cares for his own people, you're to care for her. We're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones, verse 30, and for this reason a man leaves the, his father. Now this takes us back to the whole point of what we were talking about earlier before we got into this message and what Steve was referring to in terms of the nuclear family. Because it takes us back into Genesis before the fall. And this is God's design. man shall leave his father and mother. Now this is, it's believed to be commentary or explanation given by Moses as to what happens as a result of the marital relationship. A man shall leave his father and mother. The ties between son and daughter and parents is not as strong as the tie between a husband and wife. It is an inviolable union, whereas that which flows from our bodies, our children, our progeny, are not vitally united to us. You are vitally united to your wife, husbands, and you become one flesh and you are to care for her as you care for yourself. And so he says, this is a great mystery. The union of a man with his wife. And also with respect to Christ, Christ and the church, both of them are mysteries. And so he concludes here in verse 33, he makes his final appeal. To his readers, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's very easy for a woman to respect a man who loves her and treats her with respect and shows self-sacrificial kindness to her. 
This is God's design for the home. It's, I mean, it's clear. It's under assault today on every level. It is the desire. I mean, it's one, one of the elements of the Communist Manifesto. And it's, it's manifest itself if you read the, 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 the statement of Black Lives Matter is to destroy the family. That's one of their stated goals. And that's what communists do. And there is a party out there that is advocating for that on every level to destroy the nuclear family. I blame it on the institutions and society. I blame it on government. Well, ultimately, behind the scenes, I blame it on Satan. That sinister foe of Christ himself. But it seems as though God has taken his hands off of Satan and unleashed him on the world, not only with his co-head, but with the, the whole perversion of society. And the only thing that's going to straighten it out, I think, ultimately, is Christ coming back again to set up his kingdom, to judge this world, to deal with his nation, his people, Israel, they're in the land, they've been there 72 years now, their last anniversary. And so I believe as with other prophetic students and scholars, that we are seeing all the signs being fulfilled on a global level. And the time is short. The time is short. Whether something unfolds this year, unfolds in the, the years to come, I believe we are going to see the coming of Christ for his church make any predictions. But I think about it more and more and more as I see the darkness of our hour. The only thing that's going to remedy it, if it's going to be remedied, because we're in that last phase of Romans chapter 1, where he's given our leaders over to a reprobate mind. That means a mind that doesn't know right from wrong, can't discern right from wrong. That's where we are. The only thing that's going to remedy it is a purification of the church, a revival within Christendom, and a restoration as we refer to the first principles in our constitution to bring back law and order to our world. Law and order. But even beyond that, God is reaching down into this world in a special way like I've not seen before and touching parts of the world that, that were untouched for many years. Iran, they're experiencing a great harvest of people. Israel is experiencing a great harvest of Christians through different organizations, especially when you group called One for Israel. God is reaching. As we saw Wednesday night, we, we looked at a, a video by Avi Lipkin, and he's estimating that, it, that there'll probably be a war between Israel and Iran in the near future. And even Turkey might fit into that equation. There's going to be a war. Israel's going through a time of fast. Their main, one of the main industries is tourism, and that's been suspended for all intents and purposes. God's not through those people. God is reaching down into that society through different organizations, missions, agencies, and bringing a harvest of people. And I listened to a testimony of one Israeli after another Israeli. Why have our leaders lied to us? Why have they hidden this from us for so long? That you're sure Jesus is Hamashiach. He's the Messiah. And oh, the transformation in these people's lives to have that veil that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, to have the veil lifted. And they embrace Messiah, the Jew.
joy, the peace. They have a Bible college, one for Israel now, in Israel, where they train people from the Hebrew Scriptures, the original language. That's what the Bible was written in. It's, uh, you know, three, I like uh, back in seminary when the guy said, three quarters of the loaf is the Old Testament. <laughs> So we learn that God is reaching out in Israel, in China, in India. The church is going forward. He is calling out a people for his name's sake. That's the exciting part about it. But in our country, we're in decline. We're retrogressing. We're not progressing. And unless God intervenes and people are crying for a great harvest, that's something that the, the Holy Spirit, that's why we call on you Saturday mornings to pray. Pray that Jesus would intervene in his church and bring reformation and revival. I pray that for our dear brother, Mishka, in Finland. That's a dark country most of the year, physically speaking, but it's a dark country spiritually. And I'm praying for Miss Good that God would use him as a new Luther, a new reformer in that country. We need God to raise up men who reform the church today to bring it back to scriptural soundness and the Word of God. Beyond that, to our text, we need the nuclear family as defended. It, it's, it's kind of the last bastion. It's, it's the final institution that Satan attacks to crumble society. Because if you don't have a solid family, you don't have a solid society. That's God's design, not my design. not man's design, it's God's design. We need to pray for our homes. I pray for you young people especially. You're facing difficult times. There will be pressure applied to you. To go along with the crowd. To capitulate to society. To yield to, to compromise. And we need to stand in these days with the God of truth, the God of scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we got together. We ask that you would take your powerful word, it's living, and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. May it pierce through our hearts. change our homes, change our families, change our society. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name.